<laughs> things, things got real wibbly wobbly up in here. <laughs> Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsbill and today is Halloween and we are doing the Monster Bash. Look, it's a classic, you can't blame me. This year for October I was invited by Trent from Miscast to participate in the Monster Bash, which is a massive collaboration between a bunch of creators. All the people participating uh, make up a bunch of different bits of monsters, like a claw, or a head, or a tail. And we all put them together, and we shuffle them up into a deck of cards. Or actually, this year, there's a, a nifty video randomizer. Ooh! You go check it out. You can make a monster yourself. Little, little bit of a trypophobia warning uh, for some of the cards. And then we all get together and we drew seven cards from the deck at random. And we had to take those elements and we had to make a monster out of them. And so the challenge begins. The cards I received were the following. Ping, 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 ping. You will notice that I have uh, two monster heads, two monster tails, and two sets of monster legs. And a boat. <laughs> But it just seemed so neat that I got three of each that I thought to myself, I could, I could do something, I could do something different with this. Maybe we could figure out some sort of a Jekyll Hyde thing going on with my monster. Now the other thing to keep in mind here is that most of the other participants in the Monster Bash are like artists. They, they sculpt and they build and they make uh, models and they paint and they, they do all these incredible artistic things. I, on the other hand, uh, I, I draw a little bit and I design stuff for D&D. That is a perfectly legit artistic format. The only reason that I bring it up is that I did want to bring something to the table that would have a little bit of oomph factor, a little bit of spice for when I presented my monster to the other participants. And of course, at about 4am one night, while thinking about Jumanji, as one does, I came up with an idea. If anyone else had the Jumanji board game from, what, the late 90s? It had this little thing... I should go find... I, I'm gonna go find it. Alright, so, in place of that gem, the magic gem in the middle of the board game, the glass orby thing. The board game had this, and and the cards are basically, it has words written in blue, but you can't read them because they've got printed red patterns over the top. You can't read them until you put it, you slide it in under this bit of, I don't know, red cellophane, and suddenly it cuts out all the red, and you can read what it says. It says, raging waters ebb and flow, beware piranhas, down below. Honestly, Really nifty little mechanic. I thought that this might be a fun little gimmick to apply to my Halloween Monster Bash D&D encounter. So I made these. These little um beauties. <laughs> I had to go with green cellophane instead of blue. They apparently just don't sell much colored cellophane in stores anymore. And this is all I could find. Um, if you make these with cardboard, they can have ears on and just you can wear them like like 3D glasses. I made these with paper, so I, I have opera glasses instead. <laughs> I also made these uh, <laughs> out of some old Hoyt Cinema 3D glasses circa 2010. These ones are for the GM, because you can close one eye and see red, close the other eye and see green. If you can't wink, I can't help you. <laughs> Now what's a gal to do when she has an encounter, and a monster to design, and a couple of cellophane like 3D glasses looking things? She goes to her Twitch chat. I sat down with my community on Twitch and we spent three or four hours just really smashing out some really cool ideas for what this monster could be and how we could incorporate all of these different bits. BITS! The torso for both is a boat. That's, I mean, you know what? we can write that down. So a monster in two different quantum states, that's a great way of describing it. Looking at these combinations, what is what is standing out to people? Here we go, here we go, here we go. That's interesting from Fire Donut. I think each monster could act very distinctly. Then, for a villain action, have the players swap the version that they have to deal with. Look, I'm styling. You you wish you had my, my 3D glasses. I'm breaking out of the matrix. Put them over the camera so you can see, let's try it. Everything's red! So what do we think of when we think of pigs? What can we what can we give to it there? We've got a number of people suggesting pigs eat things. They eat everything. Yeah. What are some associations for chickens? That's true. Chickens can survive for a long time with their heads cut off. So maybe it's hard to kill. I just like the idea of it being uh, the living and the dead version of the same creature. <gasps> That's a really good idea. We're going with froggy piggy chicken, Gus Bob jumpy jumpy legs, <laughs> jumpy jumpy legs. 
I really like Barbagus. I really like um, Anaglyph and Never There. Both are great names. I really like Deep Sea Croker. The name is state based. If you can see it, it's an Anaglyph. If you can't, it's a Never There. Oh, I like that. There's still room for that concept of the this is the living, vital version of the being. This is the sort of dead, decaying version of the being. I like there being a mirroring in the two forms. If the frog face grabs and pulls, the Gus face spits and spews. Okay, so I like the tongue, I like the eating, because then you get a really um, consistent thing of like, the tongue whips out, grabs someone, swallows them, right? Deep sea croak, <laughs> frog picture kick. This is, this is going really well. Maybe once the frog swallows them, maybe that's when people, people were talking about the idea of changing glasses partway through. Maybe that's the thing that triggers the glasses to change. Maybe once you get swallowed, you get spat out in the other combat. And now you have to swap your glasses. Now you're fighting the other thing. I can see what Barbicus gets out of this. They need the DSC to consume things to have a form. I'm unsure what the DSC gets out of it. Are they symbiotic biomes? So symbiotic that they are literally one creature? Well, I think they are literally one creature. They are both the living and the dead form of themselves at the same time. Is this a functioning boat? Or is this a, um, a, a shipwreck? Is this ruined? Is it both given the dual nature of living and dead? Is it both a shipwreck and a functioning boat? Oh, baby! We got a live one! There we go, we got a thesis statement to work with. Maybe, maybe the boat is in the time fall. And some people look out into that bay and they see a ship and some people look out and they see a shipwreck. We're reaching tenet levels of timey wimey here. Yeah, we time traveling now. The Barbagus is basically dead, but there's just, there's so much life in its in its living form that the body keeps going. It's like, as long as the, the deep sea croaker keeps feeding vitality to its future self by eating more now, it can keep the body going for even longer. So there's no life, there's no life, the chicken with its head cut off thing. That's a cool moment for the end of combat, right? You've killed it, hooray, how do you want to do this? And then the body keeps going. It's not resurrected, it just keeps going. It has zero hit points right now, it's just still acting. Does the Barbius have zero hit points? Because I just stumbled across that while talking, but I don't hate it. The Barbius might have zero hit points, because then all the fighting is about the Croker. This is, this is my perspective on it. So the body can keep going afterwards, but it's this time fold that has allowed this creature to become so dangerous. And the Croker has been able to keep its its future dead body alive for way longer than it ordinarily would be if it wasn't part of this temporal fracture. So once you kill the croaker, it stops being able to feed vitality to its dead future self. And so the Barbagus begins to fall apart. Very quickly, like as soon as the first person gets swallowed, for example, and gets sent to the other perspective and changes their glasses, everyone's gonna suddenly want to change glasses. That's gonna that's gonna set this little thing in their head that makes them go, oh wait, I wanna do that. We can do that, I wanna do that. Be withholding. Don't let them look through each other's glasses. No, if you if you're gonna look through the other glasses, you have to you have to find a way to, to switch perspective. And they'll start looking for that. Maybe the lair action forces PCs into another perspective, but also provides PC opportunities to switch during their turns. That is a very simple idea. Big old time travel whirlpool. Yes, exactly. So now with a whole lot of cool ideas to work from, I sat down and I tried to build a monster encounter that really functioned. People who are familiar with my, uh, with my channel, my setting, stuff that I explicate frequently, those people will probably know that I talk a lot about the idea of having different planes of existence all occupying sort of the same space. So you have the Prime Material Plane and the Feywild are just kind of on top of each other. And at certain times of year or in certain spots, like where ley lines meet, it just becomes really easy to accidentally cross over into another plane. For this particular beastie, we were playing with the idea of different times laid over top of each other. Present and the future occupying the same time in the way that multiple planes might occupy the same space. And once we had this idea of, uh, of the frog pig chicken combo, that we took to calling the croaker and the slimy head tattoo legs uh, barbed tail combo monster which now goes by the name the never there we really started playing with concepts of vitality and decay a pristine present and a degraded future so here's what we've got the important thing is that at the beginning of the session half of your players should choose 
green glasses and the other half should choose red. Rather than describing the things that they see, I want them to identify the differences. I want to, without my interference, have the players incidentally describe things the others can't see. So I made two pictures, one in green and one in red, and laid them on top of each other. The players with a green perspective will see the red image, and the players with a red perspective will see the green image. For the record, th these do work a little bit better in real life than they're working on camera, but I wanted to really show you how it works in action, holding up the image and and just swapping out the cellophane. For the rest of them I might just put up like a digital replication. The player party arrives in a port town. It's not, it's not a big, huge, bustling place, but they get enough business. Let's give the town a name, let's call it Haversport. While in Haversport, the party are approached by a woman who says that her husband, a former sailor, has gone missing. She wants their help to try and find him. She gives you a description of the sailor, says that he'll be recognizable due to all of his tattoos from his many years on the sea. Through conversation, the party can discover that this retired sailor has been busying himself by uh, by looking for treasure on beaches and, and uh, examining shipwrecks where he can. The woman says that he kept talking about a shipwreck out in the harbour. He wanted to go and explore the wreck, see what was left. The thing is, she says, there is no shipwreck in the harbour. Up at the top of the hill, the player characters can get a view of the harbour. Half of them, those wearing green glasses, will see a ship. Maybe positioned a little close to the cliffs that curve around the edge of the harbour, but there's nothing amiss. Players wearing red glasses, however, will see the shipwreck in exactly the same place, smashed up against the rocks. Those wearing green are seeing the present. Those wearing red are seeing the future. If the players go and investigate the ship, upon deeper investigation, they will find the croaker. This is the green perspective monster. If anyone happens to make a, a nature check, they would probably know that this is a relatively harmless creature. It can grow, you know, yay big. It's known for being gluttonous and a pest. It occupies spaces like, like the larder of a ship, devouring all of the food there and leaving the sailors to starve. So even though they're cute, People don't particularly like them. On the whole though, they're mostly harmless. They do have one interesting thing about them, which is that when they are killed, they can spend up to a minute running around and still acting as though they're alive. That's what creature inhabits the present. However, the temporal fold that this ship has become caught in, the future dead version of the croaker, in this encounter referred to as the never bear, that future dead version of this creature is also in this space inhabiting the shipwreck. As it so happens, because of this temporal fold, the future never there is being sustained far longer than it ordinarily would be. As long as the croaker continues to devour vitality, the never there that exists in the future in the same place is just able to keep on going. On top of that, things that the croaker has swallowed and absorbed begin to be represented in the never there. Some hapless young wyvern tried to make its nest on the ship that wasn't moving and the croaker swallowed it and now the never there has a wyvern sting. This poor retired sailor came to investigate the shipwreck and now the never there has humanoid legs covered in sailor tattoos. Hopefully those with red glasses on will see the tattoos on these legs and say it's him. It's the sailor. And those in the green glasses will be like, what are you talking about? This thing has chicken legs. So now the players enter combat, but they're looking at two different maps. So what did we do? We drew the maps in red and green. Looking at the stat blocks, and you'll have to excuse me, I, I didn't think to print off one that was just in black and white, so let me see. I made this uh, this print off of the stat blocks for people who aren't cowards. So just to uh, cover the significant elements of the battle, rather than boring you with every single detail, you can read the details, I've written it out. So key elements include the fact that, uh, that the croaker and the never there are temporal duplicates of one another, so they share the same space. Um, and each of them rolls an initiative separately as though they are two monsters. But after the croaker finishes its turn in initiative, the never there immediately takes a turn because they are also the same creature. And of course, when the never there takes its turn in initiative, the croaker can immediately take a turn also. So although this is technically one creature in the form of two creatures, uh, it gets four turns, which evens up the action economy a little bit, making this a bit more of a challenging encounter. So so it is very important that you remember that all of these player characters are in the same space. They are all fighting at the same time. They are all being fought at the same time. They are all present in both temporalities, but each player is only perceiving one of the temporalities. The never there, it is dead, so it has various damage immunities and condition immunities as 
tend to be seen in uh, dead things or constructs. Note that this is not an undead creature. It is not undead, it is simply a dead thing that is moving, like a, a headless chicken. One of the results of this is that you can't actually kill the Never There. As long as the croaker is still alive, it is still feeding vitality to the Never There. In order to kill the Never There, you have to kill the croaker. I keep going to turn the page to read the other stat block rather than just swapping my eye. Creatures who have green perspective perceive themselves as fighting the croaker. So if they happen to take damage from something the never there does, they take half damage. And the same vice versa, if you have red perspective, you perceive yourself as fighting the never there, so you only take half damage from any effect coming from the croaker. But we want full impact from this gimmick that we're using here, right? So we want ways for people to swap glasses. We want them to be able to swap perspective and suddenly go, whoa, that's what this thing looks like. The croaker has an attack where it can kind of whip out its, its frog tongue and grab someone and swallow them. And if it swallows that person, then on the never bear's turn, it can sort of suck a little bit of life out of them and then spit them out. But when they get spat out by the never bear, their perspective has shifted and they have to swap from green glasses to red glasses. Now, the danger with this is that because you need to kill the croaker in order to kill the never there you don't want everyone to end up with red glasses on right it's a good thing that one of my cards was the ship but i wanted to incorporate the ship into the actual encounter so uh it's not quite a lair action i guess it's more like a, like an environmental action at initiative zero of every round the stormy waves will batter the shipwreck they have to make a, a strength check or be slammed into the wall on the far side as the wreck is thrown up against the rocks over and over again. Now you may notice that on the uh, red perspective version of the map, there's a large section of floor and wall missing. Ideally, and you may have to force this to happen with the actions you take with the never there, at some point you want one of the player characters to fall through that gap. Because yes, while from their perspective this is a shipwreck, there is no floor, at the same time it is also a ship in perfectly good condition. And if your character looks to fall through this gap into the stormy waters and onto the rocks below, actually they'll find themselves on solid ground, slamming into the wood of the ship's hull. And when this happens, their perspective shifts back to green. Once your players know this, they'll be able to take advantage of it and deliberately throw themselves into that gap in order to go and continue the fight. Because ideally you want to keep this, this thing going where people continuously are shifting perspective so that you don't end up with just everyone fighting the never there or everyone fighting the croaker you really want that that perspective split between between your party there's more tidbits in there and how it works of course but but this is the the main thing this is the gimmick you understand it you get it this was so much fun to make uh i don't know whether anyone is ever gonna run this particular encounter for their party maybe as a halloween thing boy was it a fun way to stretch my creative muscles there's going to be a playlist of all of the monster bash uh videos that have been made from other other people in on the collaboration so i'll link to those wherever they may be go check them out some incredible things were made these are these are really brilliant artistic people I have been busier this month than I maybe ever have I am part of a panel of hosts on the uh, the new Eldritch Lorecast which is a podcast uh, covering D&D news but also consistently gets into sort of the philosophies of, uh, of tabletop game design with the likes of Ben Byrne from Ghostfire James Hake, who has worked on so much stuff, uh, you know, Dragon Heist, Descent into Avernus, the Critical Role campaign settings, and Sean Merwin, who has just, he's, he's so good and he's got all this design experience and he's so good at like explaining it and teaching it because he does teach it. And every time that Sean and James start talking about design stuff, I just sit there like, wow. This is incredible. I think the podcast has covered some really cool stuff already, even only in the first, what, four episodes? Last episode we had Runesmith on as a guest, and a bird got into his office, so you can see that there. I am something like 30 subscribers away from 100,000 subscribers, so that is huge news for this channel. So, I don't know, I guess stay tuned for, for news of how we're gonna celebrate. I don't really know how to react, but I'm very excited about it. Apart from that, I, I think that that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma, and I'll see you some other time. Happy Halloween!
Go make some monsters. I want to see what monsters you make.